You know, the special each time, each Sunday morning, it leads us as we sing our congregational hymns, that's praise and worship. And then the special music just further leads us into God's word, hearing his word preached. And so this morning, I pray you just meditate uh, on the words of this song. They're beautiful words with a great message. And then our pastor will come and preach to us from the word of God. we travel this earth shifting sands that transcend all the reason of man but the things that matter the most in this world they can never Calvary. Say amen. amen. I love that song. Appreciate that, Brother Robert. Well, it's good to be with you this morning. And I know some of you don't think I should be up here this soon after my little surgery. 
But I want to tell you, I met with a surgeon last Wednesday, and he gave me the green light. Matter of fact, Betty asked him. She said, now he wants to preach, son. Tell him, tell him. He said, it's okay. That's not what Betty wanted to hear. I think she just likes hearing Matt preach more than me is what I think. Matter of fact, the doctor said, actually, he's probably in better shape to preach now than he was the last time he preached. Now, that's August 4th, Sunday morning. I'm sure people ask, now, how do you feel today? I said, I feel great. I went home and had a heart attack. You don't ever know how you feel. You just think you're feeling great. So, uh, By the way, how many here have had open heart surgery? Would you raise your hand? All right. We're going to get together and compare scars after service. I know I've got the ugliest one right now. Arville showed me his, and I can't even see it. It's been so long. But I'm glad to be here, and I appreciate your prayers. All the cards and calls and visits and food, I uh, appreciate that so much. appreciate Dr. Smith. If you want to have heart surgery, Dr. Smith's a pretty good guy to, to call on. He did a great job, and the folks at St. Francis Hospital did a wonderful job taking care of me. Nurse Betty's done a wonderful job since I've been home. She has made sure that I do everything I'm supposed to do. But I appreciate her and Shelby. They've been taking good care of me. Appreciate Brother Matt. Matt's done a great job filling the pulpit in my absence. And uh, that makes it a lot easier knowing that you've got somebody as capable as Brother Matt to come and uh, take care of things while you Heal up and get better. Now, I'm not going to shout and stomp around any this morning. I'm going to take it easy. Because I just want to have a little talk with you today. We're going to continue our study of the Olivet Discourse. If you'll take your Bibles and go to Matthew 25. This Thursday and Friday is Rosh Hashanah. Now, those of you that are Bible students, you are aware of the seven feasts of Jehovah that God gave to Israel, seven annual feast days that they were to uh, remember each year. There were four in the spring, and there were three in the fall. I think we've got a chart that uh, can show you how that works out. And in the spring festivals, they actually were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. He was crucified at Passover. Unleavened bread spoke of his sinless body that was sacrificed. Then on the Feast of first fruits, he rose from the dead. Then at Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell the, Holy, to indwell the church. So in his first coming, he fulfilled the spring festivals that would obviously mean that the fall festivals will be fulfilled in his second coming. That just makes sense, right? And Rosh Hashanah, which will be celebrated this week, beginning Thursday, is the Feast of Trumpets. It's also Israel's New Year's Day. And so many believe that the rapture and resurrection could take place at the Feast of Trumpets. The trumpet shall sound, and we shall be called up to meet the Lord in the air. There's going to be a series of trumpets during the Feast of Trumpets. Then the next one is the Great Day of Atonement, which many believe will be fulfilled at the judgment seat of Christ. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, which will be fulfilled during the Millennial Kingdom of Christ when Jesus comes to tabernacle with his people here on earth and reign on earth from the throne of David. So, thinking of that, and uh, we might ought to have rapture practice today, amen? Y'all remember that? Because this could be the week. I get excited, folks, every year. And I'm not saying that he cannot come any other day but Rosh Hashanah, but I can't help but get a little excited. 
that this could be the time. When you look around, see what's going on in Syria and, and Iran and Russia, folks, that's all ready. We could see the rapture and the battle of Gog and Magog just like that. If you don't know what that's all about, then go to check out my tapes. Because I preached on all of that. But when we talk about the rapture, we're talking about Christ coming to catch his people out. We will meet him in the clouds. We will go back to heaven with him. The unbelievers are going to be left behind. Amen? They're going to have to go through the great tribulation, uh, the time when the Antichrist will come and reign on earth. And God's judgments are poured out, as you read about in the book of Revelation. We noted last time I preached the the last part of chapter 24 was the parable of the faithful and wise servant who is ready for his Lord to come. There was also an evil servant who was not ready for the Lord to come. Now in all of that discourse, he's been talking about the signs of his coming, what's going to happen, and the key here is to the believers, be ready, watch and be ready when the Lord may come. I believe these parables are just illustrating the fact we need to be ready. We need to be prepared because the Lord may come at any time. So we get into chapter 25 and we look at another parable. This is the parable of the ten virgins. I want to ask you to stand with me if you're physically able. <coughs> Let's look at Matthew 25 verses 1 through 13 and note this parable. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. They didn't take an extra supply. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. And here's the key again. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> First of all, let's note the background of this parable because he's using a picture of a wedding to illustrate his coming and how we should be ready for his coming. And, uh, of course, back then, 2,000 years ago in the Middle East. They do, they do things even today a little differently than we do when it comes to courtship and marriage. Uh, back then there was the proposal and purchase. They would have to purchase their bride. The bride's family would receive a dowry from the groom's family. And so there was that arrangement that was taking place and the bride was purchased now we understand how that applies to Christ don't we? because Jesus the heavenly bridegroom came and has purchased his bride we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ if you are a child of God if you are saved then you have been bought you have been redeemed that's what the idea there is so the heavenly bridegroom came he proposed his love to us, and those of us that have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we have been purchased by the bridegroom. 
Then there is the preparation and presentation. There was a betrothal back then. The bridegroom and his bride would enter into a, a period of betrothal or being espoused to one another or being engaged. Except the engagement back then was a lot uh, stricter than what it is today. Some ladies, they would be engaged to a different guy every other week. There's not much to it. But back then, it was different. It was kind of a binding contract involved. And it would require something like a divorce to break that betrothal agreement. Now, we are betrothed to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been purchased. The wedding hasn't taken place yet, but we are espoused to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are to be faithful to Him during this period. We're not to hold hands with the world, are we? We're not to be unfaithful. We are to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, looking for that time when He will come for us and take us to the wedding feast in His Father's house in heaven. And then there's going to be the wedding itself. The groom will come and take His bride, take her back to the Father's house, and her great wedding feast will be prepared and ready. Now, when we're raptured out, we're going to be going to heaven, right? What are we going to? Well, one thing, there's going to be a wedding feast that we will, at least some of us, will get to attend. And I'll explain that a little bit more later because not everybody's going to be a part of this wedding feast. Secondly, think about the bridegroom. <coughs> As I said, Jesus is the bridegroom. He will come from his father's house to claim his purchased bride. He has established his kingdom. Matter of fact, if you study the Bible, uh, David mentions Messiah as a bridegroom. So does Solomon. So does Isaiah. So does John the Baptist. They all refer to the Messiah as the bridegroom from heaven who will come and receive unto himself a bride. That is talking about the second coming of Christ. Look over in Revelation chapter 19 with me. And here it describes what we're talking about. Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse 6 with me. John the Revelator said, And I heard as it were <coughs> the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Notice this, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Now we're not talking about one individual, we're talking about a group of people. The bride of Christ will be a group of believers. And to her was arrayed that she would be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now notice verse 9, And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Blessed are they who are called to the marriage supper. That means there's going to be some who will be part of the bride of Christ. There's going to be some who will be there as guests. That's what our text is talking about, these ten virgins. These ten virgins are not the bride, are they? They're the bridesmaids, right? They're not the bride of Christ, but they are going to be the invited guests. Now, by the way, when you think of, <coughs> think of this, Folks, salvation is a lot like marriage. You married folks, y'all went through the courtship and the proposal and the engagement, all of that, right? There was a time when I proposed to Betty and asked her to be my bride. Now, she had to answer me. She had to say yes or no. And she finally said yes after I bugged her a long time. She said yes, and we got married. Now think of this. 
Jesus Christ, the heavenly bridegroom, comes, he comes proposing. He says to each one, I love you. I died for you. I want to be in your life. I want us to live happily ever after together. He's making a proposal. Now, it's up to us to say yes or no. Those of us who are saved, we are saved because we said yes to that proposal. We said, yes, Lord, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Others have said no. No, Lord, I don't want you in my life. I don't trust in you as my Lord and Savior. Now, folks, your eternal destiny is determined by what you say, how you answer his proposal. Yes or no? It's up to you. But you've got to make that decision. You've got to make that choice someday. So it is that those of us who have trusted Christ enter into a very special relationship with him. Then think about the bridesmaids. <coughs> ten, ten virgins are mentioned here. As I said, they're not the bride, they're the bridesmaids. They make up the bridal party. Go with me to Psalm 45 quickly. Or slowly, I don't care. Just go to Psalm 45. And uh, I, I ran across this, which kind of tells us how it was back then. Psalm 45, verse 13. It says, The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought into the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions, that follow her shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. And they shall enter into the king's palace. So there's the idea the virgins, her companions, accompany the bride during this time. Now, there's a lot of speculation about these ten virgins and what they represent. There was five faithful virgins. Now, we don't really have much trouble with that. The five faithful virgins would represent saved people who are ready and waiting and expectant when the bridegroom comes. They are taken to be with him. And we have people here that would be in that category. You are faithful. You are serving the Lord. You do believe he's coming at any time, and you are expecting, you are anticipating his coming. And you look forward to it, amen? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Those are the faithful and wise virgins, similar to the faithful wise servant in the previous parable. Now, the five foolish virgins. Now, here's where we get into some problems. Here's some difficulty now trying to identify who the five foolish virgins represent. Five foolish virgins that uh, are not ready when the bridegroom comes. Now let me point something out. They all have the same assignment, right? They all have the lamp with oil. They all have a sense of expectation. They all go to sleep. Right? It's not that the five foolish went to sleep and the five wise didn't. They all went to sleep. They all awakened at the same time. They all rush out to meet the bridegroom. It's only then that we discover a difference. Only five of them have enough oil to last through the procession going to the bridegroom's house. Five have enough extra oil. Five did not bring any extra oil. Five did not expect the delay to be so long. All they had was the oil that was already in the lamp they did not bring an extra vessel in case there was a delay, right? 
The five wise did. The five foolish did not. Well, what does that mean? What's this trying to tell us? Are the five foolish virgins, do they represent unsaved church members? It's what some say. They say, well, these five represent those who uh, had made a profession of faith and their names on a church roll, but they've never really been born again. They're like Judas Iscariot, right? Who claimed to be a disciple of Christ, but was never truly saved. There's a lot of people today that that's true, that we have a lot of lost people in our church roles. There's no doubt about that. There are a lot of people that make a profession of faith. They get baptized. They join the church. They attend church. They sing and, and weep. And uh, really, you know, you really can't see any difference in them. But deep down, something's missing. They never really repented, never really were born again. They're just lost church members. And sadly, there's a lot of them. So is this representing unsaved church members? People who never really let God carve out a space for himself in their heart and soul. They don't have that reservoir of Holy Spirit oil. I think one of the saddest verses in the Bible is Matthew 7, 23. When it talks about a lot of religious people standing before Jesus, saying, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these things in your name? And Jesus will say to that group of people, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The good works they thought they had done in the eyes of God was works of iniquity. Folks, any works you do in unbelief is not acceptable to God. Well, is that the case? Are these unsaved church members? Or here's a second possibility. Are they not unsaved church members, but just unfaithful church members? Could they represent saved people who are not prepared for the coming of Christ? Now, let me point out, and this is what I think is the case, by the way. I think this represents unfaithful church members. That would go along with the context. Let me point something out. Here's a story about ten virgins. It's not about five virgins and five harlots. Amen? They're all virgins. They all have lamps with oil. If the oil represents salvation, they all have that. The five foolish had oil in their lamps, but not an extra supply. Right? That's the difference. This is extra supply of oil. So I believe that they all represent believers. Otherwise, the parable is meaningless. Because it's addressed to his disciples, and the application would be to his disciples. The point is, get ready. Verse 13, watch therefore, be ready, for you don't know when the Lord may come. Some will not be ready to meet him when he comes. Keep in mind this does not represent a division between good and bad, but between wise and foolish. Not all believers are wise in living their life. Some of our members make some stupid, stupid, stupid decisions over and over and over again. They never show the wisdom that they should have. Foolish in their life. Foolish in their decision. Foolish in not being ready for the coming of Christ. We've got some people, you don't think the Lord's coming. I can tell the way you live. Those who live in immorality? Come on, they're not looking for Christ to come. Amen. They're like the evil servant that said, My Lord delays his coming. And they live 
an unfaithful, ungodly lifestyle. Not prepared. Hey, when the call came that the bridegroom was there and there's going to be the procession, the foolish found that their lamps were going out. They asked the wise to share their oil with them. Think about this. Whatever the oil represents, it's not something that can be shared. Right? This is not something that can be shared. Now you think about this. I cannot share my salvation with you. I cannot be saved for you. Right? That's something you've got to do. I cannot share my baptism with you. I cannot share my church membership with you. I cannot share the work that I do for Christ with you. I cannot share these things you do or you don't do. Nobody can pray for you. Nobody can witness for you. Nobody can teach a class for you. You do it or you don't do it. Some things cannot be shared. Amen? I cannot grow in grace and knowledge for you. I cannot do your work for you, and you cannot do mine. Nobody can prepare for Christ's coming for you. I'm trying to help you get ready. I'm trying to help you prepare but whether you do or not, it's up to you. It's up to you. You can leave here just as you came, and there not be any change made. But if you do so, you're foolish. You ought to let God speak to your heart today and help you get some things straightened out in your life. What happened to these five foolish? The door shut to them. They could not enter in and join the others at the wedding feast. Now, if you apply this to lost people, the five foolish are lost people, then they're shut out of heaven, right? Well, how does it apply to unfaithful saved people? Well, they're not shut out of heaven. They're shut out of the wedding feast, Right? The Lord told them, I know you not. Now we read over in Matthew 7, 23, to the lost he says, I never knew you. He does not say that to these five foolish virgins. He does not say to them, I never knew you. He says to them, I know you not. I believe he's saying, I do not know you as part of the bride or the bridal party. That is a reward you lost because of your unfaithfulness. They are shut out of the wedding feast. They're not invited. They're not guests. They're not recognized as being worthy to be a blessed and honored guest at this wedding feast. They're not treated as enemies. They're not thrown into utter darkness and destroyed. They are just refused admittance to the wedding feast. That is a reward that is lost to them. If the oil pictures the Holy Spirit and the lamp represents their testimony, you are the light of the world. Keep in mind all ten had a lamp, all ten had oil in their lamp in the beginning. The only difference is that five did not bring an extra supply. I believe that's saying that these are people who did not prepare themselves sufficiently for the coming of Christ. Hey, the task of the Holy Spirit is to get us ready. The task of the Holy Spirit is to reveal Christ to you through the Scriptures. There are levels of such revelation. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is available to everybody. Right? 
but is not used by everybody. Some quench the Spirit. Some grieve the Spirit. Some will not allow the Holy Spirit to teach them and take them to know the depths of the love and grace of God. So they're not ready. Folks, this ministry of the Holy Spirit is important. My final thought is this. Let's think about the blessed. I, do you see today, folks, how important it is to be watching and ready and prepared to meet the Lord when He comes? 1 John 2.28 says this, And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, you may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Look at that verse. Are you abiding in Christ? If you are, when He comes, you'll be able to stand before Him with confidence. Many will stand before Him ashamed. Ashamed of a wasted life. Ashamed of bad decisions. Ashamed of following the wrong crowd. Now see, as pastor, Brother Matt and I, we got a job to do. Our job is to get you ready. So you will not stand before Christ ashamed. We want you to stand before him with confidence and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. There's another verse, Revelation 21, 15. Jesus said, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. It's not the verse I got up there, but it's the verse I read. Amen. It's in Revelation somewhere. I believe after the rapture and resurrection of the saints, and I'll say people will be resurrected. I'll say people will be raptured, whether you're faithful or not. Because we've all got to stand before Christ. There's two things going to happen in heaven after the rapture. While the seven years of tribulation is taking place on earth, we're going to be in heaven for seven years. What's going to happen there? Well, there's going to be the judgment seat of Christ. We'll all stand before Christ to have our life examined to see whether or not we receive rewards. One of the rewards will be able you know, to be a part of the, the wedding feast or maybe even be in the bride of Christ. And then you go into the millennial kingdom and there will be rewards for those who are faithful. They will reign with Christ. So we're going to go to heaven and we're going to go before Christ one by one and we're going to answer to him for how we've lived this life. And based on that, we shall receive rewards or not receive rewards. Some will receive none. The second thing that will happen in heaven will be the wedding feast. I believe the judgment seat of Christ is first because that determines who will be in the wedding feast and guests. So Revelation 19, we read a while ago, is there's going to be certain people who will be part of the bride of Christ. Christ will choose his bride. I don't know. Say, Brother West, will you be in the bride of Christ? I have no idea. Christ will choose a special elect group of people that will make up his bride. I don't know who will be in that bride, but it's going to be a very select, very elite group of people. I do hope I'm there at least as a guest to see and be a part of this. Those who are not there will probably be attending a lot of classes to catch up for all the time they wasted here. So there'll be an FBI class there. You wouldn't take it here, but you'll probably have to take it there. See? They're not ready. 
I mean, they don't have time to go to a wedding. They've got a lot of catching up to do. They've got to go to beginner's class and learn stuff they refused to learn while they were here. How about it? Are you ready? I want you to be as honest with yourself as you can be. Are you ready if the Lord should come this week, Rosh Hashanah, Thursday? Are you ready? Do you love the thought of His appearing? See, not all saved people love the thought of Christ coming, do you? You know that? The prayer of the bride, when she hears the Lord say, Surely I come quickly, she says, Amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. Is that your prayer? I'll be honest, is that your prayer? Even so come, Lord Jesus? I, I want you to come this week. I'm ready. Or will you be among that group that's saying, Wait a little longer, sweet Jesus. I'm not ready. And if you're not saved, you're, you're especially not ready. Because my lost friend, if Christ comes and takes us out, you're going to be left behind. You're going to have to go through hell on earth. You're going to have to go through the tribulation period. You're going to have to experience the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan. Both are going to come upon this world during that time. The Antichrist will be Lose the demons from the pit of hell will be released. It's going to be a horrible time. If you're not saved, what you need to do is come and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior today. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of opportunity. We need to get ready. We need to help others get ready. As we stand together, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I want to ask Brother Matt to come and stand before you. During this time, if you're not saved, and you're ready to accept Christ as your Savior, you do believe what the Bible says, and you're ready now to make a commitment to Him. He's come proposing He loves you. You've got to say yes. Would you do that today? Would you say yes, Lord? I believe you did die for me. I believe that you are the Son of God. And I'm ready today to accept you as my Lord and Savior. I'm ready to repent of my sin and humbly bow before you and accept you as my Lord and Savior. Would you do that today?